I, I told him, I'm like, well, go tell the motherfucker if you want something, fucking, I'll come out there, we can get him up right now. So he's like, yeah. It was all right, I'll go tell him right now. So I'm watching this motherfucker. He still yes, had weights in prison at that time. I was huge. And this dude was like a little itty bitty motherfucker, man. But he wanted to wrestle. So things got carried away like I, I knew they would. I end up picking him up, doing my signature move. We're still leadership. We're always gonna be leadership, and you know, that's that's the way it is, man. So it was yeah. fucked up for a lot of youngsters that, that didn't know any better and just got caught up in that, man. All right, you guys, it's episode 48 of Inner Demons, and without further ado, I'm gonna jump straight back into this. Once again, we ain't doing no flim flam, and we jumping straight back in. So check it out, you guys. At the conclusion of episode 47, I talked about a few things. Now, let me recap on, on the things that I talked about just so I can get back to where I was at. Now, I had backed up because I backed up and covered something that I had previously forgot to talk about. So, you know, I went over the situation where me, Gabe Caracheo, and Chico, Robert Rose from Salinas, basically sat down and talked to this individual and told him that his mother was cooperating with the, with the law enforcement and that we basically couldn't allow it to happen. She was cooperating in an investigation regarding a young Northeno. He wasn't a C, it didn't matter. He was a homie nonetheless. And either way, we basically let him know that we couldn't allow that to happen. Now, our whole purpose was to put our fillers out there and to see where his mind was at. There was a plan in order for him if the pendulum would have swung the wrong way. Now, obviously, he's going to say what he knows we wanted to hear, and he's going to say all the things that he should have said unless he was crazy, which he did. You know, he told us that he was with it and that, you know, whatever the NF wanted to do with his mom, he was fully on board with it. But at the end of the day, he wasn't. Again, I told you guys how they ended up falling off the map, and eventually he had an epiphany. He seen the light. He came back, confessed to a murder. His mom resurfaced and she was whacked. That's what happened in that situation. A lot of you from Monterey County, you guys know who I'm talking about. And, you know, that case or that situation is, is, a, is a household. It's a, he's a household name out there in Salinas and, and it's old news. But I just wanted to include that, that that situation right there actually occurred at my house or my place in Ukiah. Now, the other thing that happened, like I told you guys, I got a call from the homies out there in Salinas about, you know, Bubba getting shot at. And as soon as I heard about that, you know, I told Vicky, I dipped out there. I went out there and I took care of what I needed to take care of out there. And, you know, enough said, I already went over the situation with you guys. I think I stayed out there about four days. After four days, Vicky basically called me and she pleaded pleaded with me to come back home. I mean, within four days, I got into a, a high speed. I got into a couple shootouts or a couple shootings and some other things that I was involved in. And, you know, the way she was looking at it was even though she didn't really speak on my business or the things that I got involved in, she was starting to fear, you know, that I was going to end up getting locked back up. I was going to catch a case. I mean, within four days, a lot of shit happened. So, you know, she wanted me to come home, which I eventually did. I made sure that that Bubba was good, Nana and the kids were good. And there were some other homies from Salinas that had basically posted up over there and, you know, they were covered. So once everything was straight in Salinas, I bounced back to Ukiah. Now, <laughs> in the last episode, I told you guys that you know, when I first went out to Ukiah, I got a job. And again, the whole the whole reason for me going out there, once I got out of parole, I got a parole from Corcoran, first time as an adult that I was no longer on adult parole. You know, from that point on, I grabbed all my stuff from Salinas and I cut tread back to Ukiah. And the whole purpose from that point was to just get a job, pick up a nine to five, pick up a lunch pail and to work, to just work. And the whole reason why I was trying to do that is to just stay up under the radar because I knew that the feds, I knew they were watching me. 
they already tipped their hand and told me that I was on their radar. And, you know, Operation Black Widow had just kicked off. So I knew I was probably an unindicted co-conspirator, meaning that at any given time, I could still be snatched up and brought in on that case. And I wasn't trying, I wasn't trying to, to just get caught up like that. So I wanted to go out there and just kind of just fade out. Not only that, like I told you guys, you know, all my, my channels had pretty much gotten caught up. Either they were caught up or they were stripped or they dropped out. One of the three. You know, I know I've said this before, but because he's the subject of a lot of things that I talk about, I'm going to say this again. You know, when when all this kicked off, I told you guys Conejo was a channel of mine. He was somebody that I was under for, for years and I had an immense amount of respect for him. At that time, he was completely different. He, you know, he conducted himself like a professional, like one of the elders, somebody that had been around and you know, as far as the things he was doing up in the Bay, he was legit. He was running, at that time, he was running Santa Rosa and that whole region out there. And, you know, I had never heard nothing negative about Conel. However, you know, as as with other other C's that end up, you know, getting so much authority and, they, and they're giving that much slack like that, he started doing faulty things. Money started coming up missing. Other people started, you know, other C's. He was sending directives out and doing some kind of underhanded stuff. So eventually it caught up with him and he was stripped. Now, when these brothers got pulled out of, out of Pelican Bay because they got indicted in Operation Black Widow, Corny, Skip, Cuete, Tex, Stork, when all those brothers left and got pulled to Santa Rita, this is when Conejo made another underhanded move by, move by coming out and trying to reassert himself as a leader. And he knew better. You know, the fact that those brothers were gone didn't mean that, you know, any, any discipline or any, any kind of whether or not he was stripped in the past or you know his street say was taken it didn't mean that he was exempt from that that it it it, it still wasn't in effect Conejo seen an opportunity to maneuver himself back up into a position of leadership and that's what he did you had Truco DC and some of the other brothers up there that had a little bit of influence Guerito and some some other cats boxer from Selma and, you know, as soon as they leave, he, he comes out and reasserts himself, probably up under the auspices of, look, I'm trying to help you guys. You know, we're in a, a crisis situation right now. We don't have our leadership is, is all in disarray. You know, we need to reset everything. And these brothers basically took all our, our money and left us high and dry. So he made it seem like he was doing the organization of favor when really Conejo was just being Conejo. And that was a foul move right there. It showed his character, showed his real character. Conejo, what he should have done was he should have respected, you know, the, the, the disciplinary actions that he had previously suffered. You know, they relegated him back down to a, a cat one and that's what he should have respected. It didn't go away because they got pulled out of the bay. But again, you know, here he is now, once these guys are over there in Santa Rita, you know, portraying himself to be one of the leaders. And you guys all know what happened after that. He took it even a step further than that. And that's why he's in the situation he's in now. So, you know, again, my point is, is, you know, I fell out of contact with him. I already knew that he was playing the other side. And uh, I told you guys, you know, as far as I was concerned, my loyalties at that time were towards leadership that had already been leadership that was already appointed leadership. So, you know, I no, I no longer had any of them to communicate with. I could didn't want to reach out to Corny and none of them at that time because where they were at and I knew they were under scrutiny. So I just faded back for a minute. Now, somebody asked what kind of job I was working out there. And I told you guys, I'll never tell you. 
somebody asked in the comments, and I'm I'm gonna tell you just because you know you guys asked, and I'm transparent. You know, it's not that big of a deal. I was I was half ass playing, but it was a janitorial job. Your boy was working. I was I was a lightweight janitor. I knew somebody that had a business out there. And it wasn't about really working. It was about just trying to stay up under the radar, trying to, you know, convince people that were watching me that I was working, that I was doing something legit and that I wasn't out there involved in no criminal activity. But, you know, I wasn't out there scrubbing toilets and, and, and doing nothing like that. You know, they had a business. It was a janitorial business. But what they did was, you know, I had a route where I cleaned hospitals and doctor's offices and things like that. But, you know, what they did, what they mainly did was a lot of the, these big businesses, supermarkets or warehouses that were just coming into business, we would go in and we would wax their floors, throw like, make their floors look like glass or we'd strip their floors or put floors in. There was different things like that. So it was janitorial slash uh, a flooring type of business. Anyways, that's that's all it was. So aside from that, you know, I told you guys that I would end up getting a directive from the brothers over there in Santa Rita. And the, the way that I got into contact with them is because I was real tight with a couple of individuals, Bubba and those individuals, BJ, and they would end up linking me back up with Corny and them. So, you know, I get the directive to go to Santa Clara. Now, I'm not going to say that as soon as I got the directive, me and Vicky bounced. It didn't happen like that. There was a lot of loose ends that we had to tie up before. You guys know how it goes. I mean, who just leaves from one day to the next? She was renting an apartment. Well, at that time, she didn't have to. She didn't have to put in her first. Uh, her she didn't have to put in notice to leave because she actually she had a a fifteen year old son at that time, and her dad was also living with her at that time. He was still alive. So, you know, her son was deeply rooted in Ukiah, went to school there, grew up there, was born and raised there, and he wanted to stay there. So she actually left the apartment with, you know, her dad and her son, and she moved out to Santa Clara with me. Now, there was still a bunch of other loose ends. We still had to, you know, we went out to San Jose or Campbell, and we got with the, the manager out there, the owner signed all the contracts and you know we had to take care of all that kind of stuff we went down to pg and he got the electricity turned on put put in our name and all that kind of stuff all those kind of loose ends so you know i want to say it was a good three weeks from the time i got the directive when we actually got a u-haul truck loaded everything up and drove all the way to to, to campbell we drove everything to campbell you know, I get out there and at that time, I didn't know anybody else out there to help me move. So I pretty much moved that whole apartment in on myself. Vicky really couldn't do too much. You know, we were on the second floor, so we had to go up a flight of stairs. Now, here's the other thing. Let me let me just address this. Now, I appreciate everybody that dropped comments, everybody that gave feedback in regards to these past episodes and all those of you that continue to give me props for inner demons. I appreciate it. The praise is always appreciated. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm humbled by it straight up, but let me say this. One of you have, have made a comment with respects to JLo and I'm going to address that specifically because the comment, I know there wasn't nothing malicious meant by it. And I know there was nothing negative that was meant by it, but, the comment was something to the effect of J-Lo should have known better, you know, to move you out there to an area like that, that you wouldn't be a good fit for that area because it was a Surano stronghold. Now, and, and, and went above and beyond that and said that not only that, you know, it was highly suspect. Now, let me say this. First and foremost, you know, I trusted J-Lo like a sister. She had you know, she stood out head and shoulders above a lot of the other females that I had to work with out there. She became like my sister and I trusted her. I trusted her more than I trusted a lot of people out there, more than a lot of C's that I was working with out there. 
So, you know, as far as that, there was nothing to be suspect about. Now, J-Lo, I don't think J-Lo looked at me as if I was like a gang member. You know, I wasn't somebody that wore Ben Davis's and, you know, a red rag hanging out my back pocket and somebody that dressed like that all flamed up looking like a, you know, a homeboy out there. I didn't attract that kind of attention. You know, I, I was somebody that could navigate and maneuver out there and pretty much fly up under the radar. I didn't attract that kind of attention. I could blend in. The only thing that make me stand out a little bit is all my, my ink work. That's it. But I believed, you know, that she believed that me moving out there, I could pretty much maneuver how I needed to in order to live there without getting into any kind of conflict. And for the most part, I did. It was other individuals, other knuckleheads that would end up picking shit off that led to one thing. It was a domino effect. And that's how the drama started. So, you know, as far as that, I, I don't think um, there was anything suspect about it. And again, you know, J-Lo did me a huge favor at that time. I didn't know anybody else out there that could help get me moved into an apartment or a house or anywhere like that so anyways let me get let me get let's get straight into it so this is where things are going to start being more i'm going to start being more you know in depth and more specific about a lot of things i'm not going to mention a whole lot of people's names as i go into a lot of this stuff you guys have read the book you guys can put two and two together if you want to know who, where, and what, and all that stuff. So three weeks, we're out there in Santa Clara. We're, we finally, we move into the apartment, and, you know, for the first three weeks, I'm just, I got my fillers out there. You know, one thing that happened that that's kind of, it. you guys understand the relevance of this, but one thing that happened prior to me paroling Prior to getting shipped off to Corcoran, when I was still in San Quentin, there was actually a couple individuals that would work with me in my regiment that I met in San Quentin. I knew a lot of homeboys from San Jose just from being in prison. So I knew I wasn't going to have a hard time finding people to work with me in the regiment. I just didn't know where they lived, you know, out there. When I got out there, I didn't have no addresses, no locations or nothing like that. But as far as you know, once I started running into people, I, I knew a lot of homeboys that had a lot of love for me. And I knew that once I got in touch with the right individuals, I'd be cool. So some of you might remember me talking about this in some of my past episodes of, of war stories or just talking about it on the channel. But this is where we're at. So I'm going to go over this again. So anyways, I'm in Quentin. I'm in C I'm housed in C-section at this time. And you know, I've been there for a couple months and your 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 one and only your favorite Lentil's there. So Lentil's there at this time, and you know, he's in he's in contact with Peggy, and Peggy's plugged in with leadership. And she's at that time, she was one of the, you know, she facilitated a lot of the communication. And if you guys remember back some of you may may remember some of you may not but there was a time when me and chico were, were tight robert rose uh chico from salinas we were tight that was my boy and i had known him for years we worked together in prison we worked together on the streets and we had that bond now the way that i looked at it was you know i i was never one to to believe in rumors i was never one to believe in hearsay and when it came to somebody's status, I wanted concrete evidence as far as, you know, to hear about somebody being no good and to facilitate that information, to pass it on. I wasn't going to do it, especially about no other seat. So when we're in Quentin on this one particular occasion, Peggy's in touch with, with Skip at that time. I believe she was in touch with Skip. And... Death Row was right above us. We were on the fourth tier, I believe, in East Block. And Death Row was on the fifth tier, 
yard side and they had the whole the whole other side of yard side. So what I mean by yard side is I mean the upper yard where the main line is. That's where right outside that you got the canteen. But the other yard side is like where their yard is, where the six yard was, all those yards. So death row was right up on top of us. And a lot of times, you know, being that death row was just literally right up above us. We used to be able to do transactions with them all the time. We used to be able to get items from canteen from those guys that we weren't able to get because we were an ad say we were able to communicate with them they'd make phone calls for us you know th there was a lot of things that there was a lot of perks that we had based on the fact that they were there in the same unit with us and that we could fish with them so you know on one occasion Peggy I guess she had talked to Skip and she sent a message down to Lencho and Lencho, he gets all hot and wet and he's like, hey, B, 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 you got to hey, check this out, man. I got one time down low. So he ends up, he shoots his line down, right? Cat can't even throw a fish line. I think he threw a old dirty shoe or something. I, I don't know. It was a shoe or... Anyway, so he, he sends his fish line down and I pull it in and it's, it's basically his little chicken scratch and it's like hey peggy said that skip and the brothers over there in santa rita are saying that chico flipped chico flipped and you know it's this is official and you know he's throwing it out there so i get back at him and i, and I tell him over the tear i tell him hey hey, hey lancho i said hey bro you know well she doesn't say his name she didn't say chico's name that's what that's what the problem was. She didn't say that Skip said Robert Rose Chico from Selena. She said the message was that the brothers in Santa Rita said that a C with the last name of a flower flipped. So Lancho assumes that it's Chico because his last name is Rose. Yeah, you know, I understand that. It's more than likely Chico. You know, his last name is Rose. I understood that. But still, I don't care how likely it was. It still wasn't nothing concrete. And I would want another C to give me that same respect, to afford me that same respect, rather than to just say, you know what? It, yeah, it's probably B. It's got to be B. And to start putting it out there that this dude's a piece of shit. He turned. He flipped. He's no good. He's a rat. So I tell him, nah, bro, we're not, we're not gonna, we're not gonna pass that along. We're not gonna filter that to nobody. Matter of fact, don't speak on it until you get concrete, you know, something concrete from them. We're not gonna put that out there. And, and we got into a, a lightweight debate about it. On the, he's like, man, bro, that's who they mean, and you, you know what I mean? He's like, what else do you need? And I'm like, like I said, bro, we're not gonna put that out there. I'm not putting it out there, and neither are you. Period. So. You know, Lencho being the little the little female that he is, you know, he gets all butthurt and we don't end up talking for the rest of the day. He probably puts me on shine for like, you know, for the rest of the night and maybe half of the next day. And then, you know, like the female he is, he sends me a little love note. Hey, you know, we're better than that. You know, we're good. Uh, you're right. You know, I, I, I should follow up on it and get a definitive answer if it's Chico or not. There could be somebody else with the last name Flores or whatever. So, like I said, I know it was more than likely Chico, and, and I even believe that it might have been. But still, that's just how I am as far as, you know, the, the consideration that you're supposed to give other C's. You always give somebody the benefit of the doubt. Straight up. I don't care how how egregious it is, how how, you know, how bad it is, you always afford somebody the benefit of the doubt. And that's what I was doing for Chico, because like I said, that's what I would want done for me. So, you know, he followed up on it and it ended up being Chico. So, you know, from that point on, I knew my boy was gone. I knew that he had flipped and it was what it was, man. So that was one thing that happened. Now, the other thing that happened over there is, 
So there was a lot of individuals that were coming through C-section that had issues. One individual in particular, his name was Juji Lokes. I want to say his name was John Cordova out of San Jose. You know, Angel from Daily City came through there. One of my one of my homies that you guys are going to hear some good war stories about. Me and him, we ran together on the streets. He's been in the system for a long time. A lot of homies probably know him. A lot of people know him from doing time. And, you know, these individuals that would come through, a lot of them knew how I was. If there was room to save these individuals, to salvage them, they would get at me. Hey, B, you know, I got... I got crossed up over here in Salinas Valley because this individual did this or this was that. You know, I never talked to nobody, never debriefed, you know, but this was a situation. And if there's anything you can do for me, man, throw me a lifeline. If there wasn't nothing I could do, I'd tell him, hey, if I can help you, I'll help you. The one thing that you need to do is be honest, because if if you're lying and you know, this is this is predicated on a lie. You're just going to end up getting hit later. So give me all the facts. If I can help you, I'm going to help you. So anyways, this one individual, Juji Lokes, he had an issue. And, you know, it, it sounded fishy. It wasn't, there was nothing I could do. I could do for him. Straight up. There was nothing that I could do for him. And I pretty much told him that he was on the first tier and, you know, the first tier at that time was all protective custody. But he was basically saying that he was down there being held down there against his will. And that, you know, he wasn't talking to none of the other PCs down there, that they all had him on shine status. He couldn't even throw a fish line out with them trying to take his line. But that, you know, his heart was still with the, with the people. So, you know, I got at him and I told him, hey, there, there's nothing I can do for you, man, straight up after looking into his situation. Well. You know, this is the first time I ended up, I, I met, I knew Willow. I met Willow because he was already out there on the yard with us. And there was a couple other individuals that came through there that would end up working with me later in San Jose. One individual in particular was Pony. So he would, Pony was on, Pony, Arthur Hernandez, you guys will see a picture of him, his ugly ass. He was actually on, I was on the fifth tier at that time, and he was on the fifth tier back bar. I never knew the individual because he wasn't the type of dude that did whole time. He never did no shoot time, so I would never run into him anyway. I think he came to the hole for something petty he did out there in the reception center, and as a result, he got thrown in the hole, and then he was getting ready to parole. So he's there, and there's a bunch of other people. I remember every time I used to walk by, he you know, be wagging his tail like a little puppy. You know, he knew I was one of the brothers there and, and he would always call me to his gate. What's up, bro? You know, which was cool. You know, I'm not saying that in, in, in any type of way where, you know, where, where there's any arrogance about it. That's just what he was doing at that time. So anyway, one day in particular, they end up calling like five northerners over the intercom they call them to be released to the reception center this was a day that they ran committee and one of those names was juji lokes john cordova that was down on the first tier he was getting ready to go back out to the reception center so as soon as i heard that i scribbled on a piece of paper this individual needs to get whacked with pieces Make sure you guys, full effect, don't slice them up. Get this individual, you know, full-fledged. Make sure this, this dude doesn't even have a chance to make his bed out there. Send two, two cats on him. I forget exactly what I said, but it was something to that effect. Send two torpedoes on him with pieces. Make sure you guys get this individual good. The way I worded it was it could be interpreted as you know, basically damn near short of killing this dude. So, you know, I scribbled it down real quick and there was another homie that was directly right underneath me that was going to catch that same chain. They called his name as well. And when they called all these guys, I even yelled out, hey, bro, you're getting cut loose. And he was like, man, I was like, I guess so. He's like, I don't know what's up. I don't know. You know, he's like, shit, they didn't cut me loose. 
but I but I guess they made a mistake, right? So I'm gonna I'm gonna go out there. So I'm like, cool, hey, I'm gonna come down in a minute. I got something for you. When you get out there, make sure you get this to the individual needs to get to. Basically, get it to an OA out there. So I told him when you get it, rewrite it in your own writing and secure it. Put it away, bro. You know, my writing is very distinctive. That's why I didn't want something like that floating around. I usually send it to a homie down the tier and have him rewrite, you know, all the things, my directives or, or any responses that I had going back out to the reception center or the main line or H unit, wherever it was going. So, but I didn't have, I didn't have time that day. Everything happened like that. So, you know, being that I was crunched for time, I, I, I silted it up real quick and I dropped it down to him. Boom. He snatches it up. And I, I, I verbally asked him over the tear again, bro, did you, did you secure that? Did you rewrite it? And he's, yeah, 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 I did. So, so he takes that, he does whatever with it. Big old dummy puts it in his letters. He just takes it. He doesn't even rewrite it. He takes my actual writing, stuffs it in his letters, and they come up and they end up getting all these guys. They take all five of them and come to find out it's a setup. They pull these guys out. They bring them down to the first tier. And on the first tier, they have like 15 cages. They're one-man cages. And they use these cages to basically strip you out whenever they're going to take you somewhere or, you know, they're going to take you to medical. You got to get in that cage. They'll reach in, put the belly chains around you. It's for their security. So, you know, if you're leaving, you'll get put in that cage until they're ready to, you know, you got a, a, a transportation officer or escorting officer that will pick you up. So they bring them down there. They put them all in the cages and then, you know, they all get escorts at the same time and they walk all five of them out the front door of Carson section. And as soon as they walk out, you have the goon squad standing right there with a lieutenant by the name of Munoz. Now, let me tell you guys about so Munoz, Lieutenant Munoz was a lieutenant that had been around in San Quentin for years. I, I I started when I started going to San Quentin Munoz. I want to say he was a sergeant, and later on he would become a lieutenant. That was, you know, he was somebody that was really heavily involved, or one of those guys that's always curious about gang activity. Wanted, you know, wants to know what's going on. Sticks his nose in stuff that doesn't belong, you know, pertain to him. Even when he wasn't part of the squad, he was just a regular sergeant, a regular officer. He would try to get involved in stuff so that's how he was now when he became a lieutenant and he had a lot more sway what he would do is he would come in the Carson section and it was like all those all the guys on the first tier that were PC'd up he would treat all of them like they were his kids literally he'd be on that first tier for hours going from cell to cell getting information chopping it up with these guys you know talking about whatever and so Munoz was out there. Now, when they walk out, they tell him, hey, you guys are about to have a bad day. You guys should have known you weren't going nowhere. They take all their property. They lock up on all their property. So they go through everything. They put these guys back in the cages. And at one point, Munoz either, I don't think he was one personally searching I believe the other officers, the goon squad was searching and they probably gave it to him. They handed it off to him. Basically, it was my kite. So Munoz gets my kite, the one that I wrote to this homie, and he walks back into the tier on the first tier. And I'm housed up on the fifth tier. But he yells up. He yells up like that. Hey, boxer. He was like, check this out. He was like, this is my fucking prison. He's like, you don't run shit here. You don't run a motherfucking thing here. He's like, hey, check it out. He's like, you know that fucking kite? That kite that you try to send out right now to have such and such hit? Well, guess what? I got that kite right here in my hand, and you're going down. You and all your boys are going down 
for what he said was a conspiracy to commit murder. <laughs> That's what he said. And he put it on the wire just like that. Now, obviously, I didn't respond, but I'm not going to lie to you. When I heard it, you know, I, I was. First of all, I was upset. I was highly upset with that individual that I sent it to. Second, you know, I was thinking, damn, I'm doing a violation, but here we go. They, they're about to stick me with a life sentence. And, you know, I knew that he had the kite. Obviously, there's no, you know, there's no way he couldn't. How, how else would he know about it? So, you know, he even said, you know, I even heard him tell the individual that he took it from. He's like, I know this is boxer's writing. I know his writing. So that's how distinctive my writing is, but that's how heavily involved this individual was. Anyways, you know, the, the whole point of telling you guys this, so what ended up happening with that is basically nothing. He didn't do nothing about it. He didn't file no, no, no charges on me. He didn't pass it off to the district attorney. What he did do though, is a couple individuals that were short to the house. They all got write-ups. <laughs> Pony was one of them. So he was he was slated to parole within a couple of days. Well, he got a write up, and the write up basically said that, you know, you were participating with a known Nuestra Familia gang member or leader, and that, you know, you were conspiring to kill inmates such and such. Oh boy, was stressed out. You think I was stressed out? He was stressed all the way out. So, you know, I get. He sends me later on that 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 night, he sends me a kite and the 115. He's like, bro, you know, what are they going to do? And I'm like, bro, you got to ride it out. I'm, you know, I'm in the same boat, except they ain't wrote me up yet. But if they're going to write you up, they're probably going to press charges on me. But nothing that happened. I think they kept old boy there or a couple of those dudes there. They kept him there a couple of days over their release date. And then they, they kicked him out. They let him go. So. Nothing happened, but that was my formal introduction to Pony, Arthur Hernandez, who you guys are going to hear a lot about as we progress with these episodes of Inner Demons. So, you know, that whole situation happened right there in, uh, in San Quentin prior to the time when I would parole, discharge, and then end up moving out to Santa Clara. So... You know, by chance, later on, I would end up running into Pony. And we'll get into that. But, you know, so I ended up moving out there. I move out there for, the, like I said, for the first couple of weeks. It's just, you know, trying to get situated and, and acclimated to that area. Trying to find my way around Campbell and San Jose. It took, you know, it's a big area. It took me a while in order to remember just how to get to the freeway and back to the house. I used to have to use my navigation all the time because I would get lost. But, you know, mo moving out there, it didn't take me long to figure out that, you know, Campbell had Southsiders out there. Shout out to the Southsiders and that Cadillac was their stronghold. I think I found out, you know, the extent of it within a couple of days, but it wasn't no big deal. I was like I said, you know, I was like, OK, it's all good. But still, you know. I don't move like that out there in the streets. I'm not flamed up and I'm not worried about running into cats like that because, you know, I just don't conduct myself like a gangbanger, you know? So I wasn't really tripping on it, but, you know, for the first couple of weeks, we just got comfortable with being in that area. I kicked it a lot with JLo and, you know, she was, the one that I depended on to get me in touch or to plug me in with a lot of different people that were out there in San Jose. I knew she knew a lot of homies out there and, you know, sitting down, talking to her. I think one night, you know, me and Vicky went down to her, to uh, her apartment. We ate dinner with her and her girls. She has two girls. I think I told you guys this already, but they became like you know, I became like an uncle to them. And I, I literally watched them grow up from the time they were like six, seven, up until, you know, up until right now, you know, so they, uh, they basically 
you know, treated me like like an uncle over the years. And now, during that one one occasion when we had dinner with with J Lo, you know, that's when I started bringing up names of individuals. And you know, one of the first individuals that she put me in touch with was was Flacco. Um, you know, some of you might watch his channel. Some of you might know who he is, but that was the first individual that she put me in touch with. And, you know, he was just somebody that when she mentioned that she could get in touch with him, I was like, yeah, you know, put me in touch with him because I know that I knew I had known him previously. This is something that I didn't talk about before, but when I was working in in, in Monterey County, Okay, at that time when I was out there working with Smokey, I was given a special, a special crew basically, or I was given special privileges to have a crew out in San Jose. And, you know, at this time I was in touch with Skip. I was, you know, working real a lot closer with Skip. And Skip had a, a nephew out there named Demetrius. His name is I think they call him, I think they call him D or, but his name was Demetrius. There's another name he goes by, but it's just not clicking right now. So, you know, he's like, uh, I got a, a nephew out there, get in touch with him and, you know, have him work under you. He's a baller out there. He makes, you know, he makes money out there. So he was appointed to work under me. There was another individual named Gato Marquez. A lot of you probably know who I'm talking about, <laughs> wannabe rapper. So, you know, Gato and Demetrius were two individuals that were appointed to work under me from San Jose. Now, there was already a regiment out there in San Jose at that time, but these guys were still appointed to me, even though I was in Salinas. So aside from those two, you had another individual, Sal Cecina Kojak, was also appointed to work under me. Now, he was in touch with, or he was running around at that time with Flacco. So being that they were tight, you know, Flacco was also thrown in the mix. Hey, there's another cat that, you know, uh, runs around with, with, with these guys. So those four individuals right there will be working under you. So, you know, I'd be out there in Salinas and they'd be, working in San Jose, but yet they would come out either Flacco would drive out there, or Demetrius would drive out there, Kojak, and, you know, they flip their product and they come drop the money off and, you know, I'd give them their directives and that's how we did it. You know, it was somewhat of an inconvenience because we weren't in the same area, but it was a special assignment for special reasons. You know, at that time, they called Flacco Sticks. They weren't calling them Flacco or nothing. No, they called them Sticks. So I had those four individuals that were working under me at that time. All of them were hermanos. Anyway, so when J-Lo mentioned his name, I knew that he was somebody that was more than likely in touch with other individuals that I needed to get in touch with, mainly the everybody that was functioning in the regiment that had dispersed. Now, previously, before I moved out there, I think either Goose or Chico was running the regiment out there. You know, there was a, a, a lot of C's that were dibbling, dabbling out there. For a minute, you had Weecho was out there, but everybody knew that Weecho was in the hat. Then you had Bad Boy from Corcoran was running around out there for a minute. And then you had Robert Rose, Chico. He was running around out there. So San Jose was getting shuffled around from different C to different C. And, you know, that was probably part of the problem when I moved out there is that there had been so much damage done by C's that had previously worked out there. They had either burned people, refused to pay them back, or were just, you know, just they were too heavy handed. And uh, they discouraged a lot of homies out there. So, you know, similar situation to Salinas when, you know, I was working out there in Salinas. There was a lot of individuals out there that had a bad taste in their mouth because they had just whacked my keel. And there was a couple. Now, a lot of you probably don't know this, but my keel was only one 
of the individuals that got hit out there. There were a couple individuals that got blasted out there. Not not just Little Man and Mike Eel, but there were some other cats. And some of these guys were just Nortanos. Some of them were hermanos. But they were, they were some solid individuals. So, you know, these cats that were getting dropped out there, you had people that were like, you know what? They didn't want to mess with the NF. I kind of got that same feeling in Santa Clara when I moved out there because of what Bad Boy had done or because of what Weecho had done. There were individuals, literally, not just homies, but connections that I ran into that were like, nah, bro, you know, I had fronted such and such 10 racks and he still didn't know, you know, you're going to pay that back for him? Hell nah. You know what I'm saying? I didn't have, I don't have nothing to do with those individuals. And, you know, if you're going to be butthurt and, and carry a, a grudge or resentment because of what happened, then, hey, you know, there's nothing I can do about that. So anyway, you know, I'm gonna say this, and I'm gonna I'm gonna conclude this one for now because you know I, I covered enough to at least right now when I when I pick up on the next episode I'm in Santa Clara County so you know I'm gonna continue to talk about how I built out there who you know how I recruited and some of the things that were happening all the way up until you know everything happened in the jail with the case and 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 everything so. You know, the last thing I'll say is that, you know, for the first couple of days after J-Lo had, had hooked me up with, with Flacco, you know, he drove me around and put me in touch with a couple of individuals. One in particular was a guy named Larry Santos. And this guy was a cool cat, somebody that I had a lot of respect for, and he was somebody that I bonded with. I never knew him prior to this. You know, if you guys think back, there was another situation where, well, I might as well just go back into it and tell you guys and end it on this situation right here. So, you know, one of the things that happened while I was out there with Flacco is, you know, we're, we're mobbing around Santa Clara, Milpitas, San Jose, looking for individuals that I'm trying to get in touch with. I believe we went by Gato's store. So he ended up hooking me up with him and some other cats. But we're driving down this one street. I want to say it was on the east side somewhere. And he sees this individual. I think his name was Smiley. I'm not sure, but I want to say his name was Smiley. Anyways, we see this individual and he doesn't have a shirt on. He's walking. He's all tacked back. And he's like, hey, that fucking dude, he owes the regiment such and such. You know, he owes the regiment. I don't know what it was. Thousand, two thousand. I'm like, flip a bitch. Let's go back, bro. So we go back and... You know, this individual is walking, we pull over, we we end up catching him right in front of his house. And, you know, we, we jump out on him and I let him do all the talking since he knows to do. I just kind of fall back and listen, and I'm going to get in where I fit in. So, you know, this individual don't know me, but he's looking at me like he's leery, like he's, you know, leery as fuck. I got no Western familiar blasting across the back of my head. He don't know who I am, but Flacco tells me, hey, check it out. You know, I know you owe such and such, and, you know, you're in debt, and you need to come out of pocket, and, you know. So the dude starts, you know, saying, hey, I ain't got no money. I can't take care of it right now. And I'm like, hey, bro, let's take this conversation to the backyard. You got a backyard, and, you know, he, it's like all the color just disappeared out of this dude's face. I guess he thought we were going to take him back there and kill him or something. It wasn't Flacco he was scared of because he knew Flacco. He just didn't know what my intentions were. So we get back there to the backyard and, you know, he goes back in on him about this, this debt. And at some point, you know, I, I get tired of hearing it. And, and I'm just, I tell him, I'm like, you know what, bro, check it out. The excuses that shit ain't going to fly, homie. You know what I'm saying? Obviously, it's been a while since you've been in debt. And so this is this is what we're going to do. We're going to walk up in your in your pad right now, and you're going to give us some kind of collateral. Otherwise, you're going to have a bad day. Straight up, I told him something to that effect. Now now he's scared. He's like, he's like, all right, man. So we walk in his house. His girl's there. His girl's mad. 
she's obviously mad because she kind of sees and hears what's going on, but she don't say nothing. You guys know how it is. If you had an old lady there, you know, and you know, or the mother of your kids, and because they had a kid, and you got some cats walking through the house, like I'm like, take that, we're taking that, I'm taking this, I'm taking that. You know, your girl would be pissed. Well, the thing that he said too before we went in the house that caught my attention was he was like, I don't got the money right now, but what I can do is, you know, I'm printing a bunch of counterfeit and I can I can, you know, print a bunch of counterfeit and have that money to you by the end of the week. I give you my palabra. He's like, I, I swear, bro, you know, straight up. So I'm like, you got counterfeit. You got you got all the machines and everything. You got all the equipment. He's like, yeah. And I'm like, let's, let's walk in the house, bro. So we go in the house and I see all the, the, the computers, the machines, the printers and all that. I tell Flacco, bag all that shit up. Get it all. Unplug it all. We're taking everything. The bills, it was like partially printed bills, stacks of bills that were printed. And this dude's broken hearted. His lady's mad, you know. I was going to, they had a BMW that, you know, his lady came cruising up in. I was going to take the BMW, but they had kids. So my thing was, you know, no matter how much of a dirt bag this dude was, I wasn't going to take their transportation being that they had kids. So you know, I stopped short of taking the BMW. Anyway, we take all the equipment and, you know, we ended up bouncing that day. Now, around just to cap that that part off, like a week, a week later, I'm printing off bills. I'm printing off. I'm going crazy. You know, I'm, <laughs> I'll tell you guys in the next episode how crazy I went. Where I almost ended up getting caught up. I ran up up a major counterfeiting operation out there in Santa Clara County where damn near every news, every local news station out there was, was putting out, you know, a story or a segment on the counterfeit that was just getting, that was flooding the area. $50 bills that were being reprinted on $5 bills that were being washed and then reprinted. So, I mean, I'm sitting back laughing. You know, it wasn't that funny when I almost got caught up. But, you know, I was there like, damn, that's me. You know what I mean? That's me right there. Anyway, like a week after, you know, we take this equipment and I'm printing all this money. I get a call from this dude and he's in the county jail. And he's like, B, look, man, I'm in the county jail right now. These homies are tripping on me. They're getting ready to smack me. You know, I... I, I told him that I was in touch with you. You know, can you please get on the phone and tell this one homie, you know, tell him that I'm good. I'm like, hey, bro, I don't know why you're calling me, but don't ever call this number again. I don't know what you're talking about, man. I knew that the county jail phone that he was calling from was being recorded. So I told him, man, you know, I don't know what you're talking about, bro, but, you know, don't don't call this number no more. So. He ended up PCing up anyway. It, he ended up PCing up. And I had a link to the jail that I was going to go through, but that, that situation right there just pissed me off. Anyways, not even a couple of days after that, his girl ends up calling me up and she's like, hey, you know, she's trying to talk between the lines, but she's purposely slipping up saying things where I knew she probably had been made and she was trying to get me caught up. She's probably sitting next to a cop. You know, she tell me like, hey, you remember when you came over here and you picked up that, uh, the, uh, you know, the counterfeit, I mean, not the, the, uh, the funny money. And, and I was like, I'm listening to her and I'm like, hey, I don't know what you're talking about. You know, but, you know, like I told, like I told you, your, your, your man, don't call me no more. You know what I mean? I got nothing else to say to you guys. And I just left it at that. So, you know, that that situation right there was messy, but it nonetheless, it was something that happened. It was something that happened. And all this happened right around the time when I just barely was just starting to put the regiment together and the, the counterfeiting stuff. I'm going to talk a little bit more about it in the next episode, because, you know, aside from going crazy, there was some other homies out there that I started working with and. That whole situation right there just got, you know, counterfeiting is, it leaves a money, it leaves a paper trail. And, 
you know, almost ended up getting caught up. And I, I believe I mentioned this to you guys before, but in the end, you know, the feds had built another case on me for the counterfeiting operation that, you know, that I was running out there. So there was three different agencies that were trying to pull me when I ended up getting, right before I ended up getting arrested. The, the agency that took me down were already like 90% done with their investigation so these other two agencies were, were were trying to they were just getting ready to hit me when you know campbell pd was like no we we got them you know we got them and then these other guys come in from you know ssu they're they're like hey we got them on a counterfeiting operation and you know again these guys told them hey we got them like on, on a life case there's multiple defendants we're like 90% done with the investigation. We're getting ready to, to, to hit them all next week. So they backed off. You know, if it would have been, they would have ended up taking us down. It would have probably been a lot worse. It would have been on a federal case. And, you know, all the other stuff would have came into play. But anyways, you know, that's that's pretty much all the groundwork that's, that's laid right there that's going to take us into Santa Clara. The next episode, you know, I'm going to start touching on, you know, the individuals that I was getting in touch with out there, how I was doing the grunt work, the things that, you know, Larry Santos was able to, the doors he was able to open up and the things that we started doing out there. Everything from we had cars with hidden compartments in them. We were making runs from San Jose to, to Mexico, you know, uh, interstate commerce, all kind of, we, was, we had our hands in all kind of shit. So anyways... With that being said, I hope you guys enjoyed this episode of Inner Demons. You know, there's some stuff I know I've spoke on before, but again, you know, when I'm running two series like Inner Demons and War Stories, some of this stuff is going to overlap. And I said this in the last episode, but I'm going to say it again. There's so much information that I'm going into literally 30 years that there's going to be times where I'm just going to back up so that I can recap on something that I missed or just spend that episode going over something that I might already talked about, but go a little bit more in depth on it because there's things that I didn't talk about. If you guys understand what I'm saying. Otherwise, if you guys want to see me blow through inner demons like that and come to an end by next week, that's what I'll do. You know, I'm trying to draw this out for as long as you know, I possibly can before I end up creating a different series. But sooner or later, Inner Demons is going to come to an end. Just giving you guys a heads up. We got a ways to go, but, you know, we'll see what happens. Anyways, this episode 48, this your boy B, and I'm out. <laughs>